Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Interdisciplinary Scientific Seminar at Wrocław University of Science and Technology. Today, our guest is Professor Peter Jordenfors. I've tried to, to say it in Swedish. Uh, professor received his doctorate at the University of Lund in Sweden in 1974. The title of dissertation was Group Decision Theory. He held various positions at the Department of Philosophy of Lund University, where since 2016 he is a senior professor of cognitive science. He was adjunct professor at the University of Technology in Sydney, and since uh, 2019 he is a senior research associate with Paleo Research Institute at the University of Johannesburg. His uh, initial research was focused on philosophy of science, decision theory, belief revision, and non-monotonic reasoning. Current research is focused on concept formation, cognitive semantics, models of knowledge and information, human-robot interaction, and evolution of cognition. He published more than 400 articles in various journals and books. The journals include science and are within philosophy, cognitive science, logic, artificial intelligence, economics, management science, linguistics, uh, psychology, archaeology, anthropology, sociology, and biology. Very impressive. As one of Sweden's most notable uh, scientists, he was elected a member of Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities. In 2009, he became a member of Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He is a member of Deutsche Akademie für Naturforscher and Academia Europe Europea. In 2014, uh, Professor was uh, awarded a senior fellowship at the Zukunftskolleg at the University of Constance. He was a member of Prize Committee for the Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of, of Alfred Nobel in 2011 till 2017. Today, our guest is going to talk about how a robot could understand the emotions, the attention, and the intention of humans, and how this could possibly be implemented in robotic systems. Professor Jardenfoss, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this generous introduction. It's an interdisciplinary seminar, and I am a cognitive scientist, and that's an interdisciplinary science in itself. Uh, I don't build robots myself, but I work with people who uh, uh, build robots. And the problem I will be talking about is related to this area of human-robot interaction. I mean, we have lots of industrial robots in, in various industries. They do very monotonous work, the, the making cars or, or, or whatever. But I will be talking about robots that we will meet as human beings in our ordinary worlds. And the problem is, how should we design them to be as useful to us as, uh, as possible? So, we have, from media, a very uh, typical view of robots. They look like this. They, uh, they, uh, uh, you, you recognize them from movies. They look, they, they look like humans. Uh, some of them are evil, some of them are good. Uh, but they, they, have, they have heads, they have arms, they have legs. They are imitating human proportions and, and, and so on. And I don't think that's a good idea. We don't really want to have robots that look like humans. And I will try to explain uh, why. So here are a couple of examples of robots that don't look like humans. This is Leonard. Looks more like a fox or a dog. And uh, it can't do very much, but it can interact and show some, some uh, interest. It can follow the movement of the ball, for instance. And here is another robot. It's Paro. 
It's a robotic seal, doesn't do very much, but it has a very nice soft skin. It's used for elderly people as a kind of uh, replacement for a real animal. You can pet it and it moves a bit and it makes nice sounds and so on. It's a companion uh, robot. It, it looks like a seal, it's not a seal, but it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a robot. And I think maybe it's much better to have robots that look like animals than look like, like humans. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that question. So, what we have, what the, the kind of robots we see nowadays in, in, in the, our ordinary world are things like these. We have the lawnmowers, that we can put them on our, 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 our lawns and they, they clean, and we have um, vacuum cleaners, automatic vacuum cleaners. They don't look like humans, they don't look like animals, they look more like cockroaches. <laughs> And they, they behave like cockroaches, and uh, maybe we should treat them like uh, cockroaches. They're not very social. I mean, they, uh, the vacuum cleaner hides under the beds and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, um, these are the robots we see. There are some other robots coming in on the scene, the autonomous cars. And uh, they look like cars. They are cars. Uh, but maybe they will not look so much like cars in the future. Maybe we, will, we don't know exactly how they will develop. This is an early stage and they are kind of amplified cars as they look now. Maybe they will look more like trains or, or something else. Here is an autonomous bus uh, driving around in a suburb of Stockholm. So they, they exist to some extent in our, in our world uh, already. But they are robots and they help us with some kind of uh, interaction. Now, there are also other experimental social robots. Uh, uh, there are many of them around. I only have some old examples. So here is 21, a, a Japanese robot. Looks very human. It's built to be, look like a human. It can do some simple tasks, helping a handicapped person getting out of the bed, for instance. Uh, it's extremely slow. Uh, you will be very bored waiting for it. Here's a, here's a German uh, robot serving drinks and medicine to elderly persons. Look how bored the woman looks like in this, uh, in this picture. I mean, it's, a, it's also a very slow, slow robot. And uh, this is again, yeah, Leonard, which is a bit faster and so on. It's, but that's an experimental social uh, robot. And I will give you a couple of more examples of, of these uh, robots. Here is, here is iCub, and I get back to an experiment I made with, with an iCub uh, later. That's become quite famous in, in Europe because it's been involved, the iCub uh, has been involved in a number of EU projects. But that it looks like a child. Uh, it's built to look like a child. Um, uh, but it's, it's made for uh, experiments concerning social interaction between humans and, and uh, uh, robots. So that's, that's the uh, background. But the problem is, and that's the problem I want to address today, is they don't know what's on our minds. They don't, it's difficult for these robots to understand what we want. With some of the robots, like the iCub, we can communicate to some extent. They understand the spoken language and we can say, give them questions or commands and so on. But human interaction is much more than just linguistic communication. So this is the problem. I want the robots to be able to do mind reading. And for me, mind reading is nothing magical. This is just the ability to understand. The robot should be able to understand what we feel, what we want, and what we think. This is mind reading. And we do that every day when we meet other people. We understand their emotions, maybe uh, via their expressions, their body language and so on. We, we understand to some extent what I want and we'll, maybe we can understand what I think by interacting mainly via, via language. Uh, so this is the problem. How do we... Uh, and yeah, by the way, I mean, my, mind reading sounds a bit ambitious. Philosopher calls this theory mind, psychologist calls it intersubjectivity. I mean, this is different terms for the same phenomenon, but I, I, I picked the, the term mind reading here. So, this is the problem I want to uh, talk about today. How can we make a robot that understands what we feel, what we think and what we want? I mean, that's the, that's the, the problem. So, and I want to divide this topic of mind reading into several components. Um, 
Uh, I have done a, a list on my, on my own. I wrote a book many years ago called How Homer Became Sapiens. That was mainly on the evolution of human thinking. But there I made a div division of mind reading into five components. Um, the first one is understanding the emotions of others. That's what's normally called empathy. The second is understanding the attention of others, knowing where others are looking at, what they're focusing on, and, and so on. The third one is understanding the intentions of others, what they want to do, where they're going, and, and, and so on. And the fourth is understanding the beliefs of others, the belief and knowledge. This is, if you have a background in philosophy, this is what's normally meant by theory of mind, understanding the knowledge and beliefs. But I think from a psychological point of view, from the point of view of interaction between uh, humans and robots, we need the emotions, we need the attention, we need the intentions as well. So we need all these four components. And the fifth component is then understanding your own thinking. Uh, the, this is the self-consciousness, the self-reflection. Self I will not talk about that today. So I will focus on, on um, the first four capacities here. And I want to discuss how can we develop robots that are able to, to have this understanding, the emotions, the attention, the intentions, and the beliefs of others. These are the four topics I want to uh, discuss. And I don't only want to discuss it in relation to robots, but I bring up three kinds of mind readers. First is humans, and in particular human children. We'll get some examples of that. The second one is what we know about animal mind reading. And I put the chimpanzee here, but um, we can have other animals in the picture. And the third one is, of course, what we know about mind reading in, in robots. And this one is Kismet from MIT Lab. It's a quite old robot now. It was built to express emotions. Uh, it looks a bit ridiculous, but uh, it was a very simple, simple um, uh, mechanism. I will get back to that, uh, well, almost immediately. That, but that is because... The first topic is understanding the emotions of others. That's empathy. So, what do we know about empathy in, in humans? Well, we know we, we have it from a very early age. Children re, re, uh, reply to other, the uh, emotions of other children very strongly. If somebody is happy and smiling, uh, the other, another child will be smi smiling. It's very contagious. If one child is crying, one child, another child will be immediately crying and so on. Empathy develops very early in humans. And uh, the, the definition is that a perception of an emotion in another activates the same emotion in the receiver. That's a kind of standard definition of, of uh, empathy. Uh, and when we get to the birds and the animals, there is evidence of empathy in mammals and in some of the birds, mainly in the crow birds, uh, ravens and corvids and, and, and so on. And um, uh, a typical example of how we test empathy in, in animals is to have, say you put a, a rat in, in a box, and, and in the box there is a lever, and you can press the lever and you get some kind of reward, a food pellet and so on. And the rat very quickly learns to, to get the, its, its rewards. But then after a while, you put another rat in another box next to the first rat. And when the first rat presses the lever, the second one gets an electric shock and, and it reacts uh, negatively. It's, no, it's a mild electric shock, but it's something that is negative to the second rat. Then the first rat continues to press the lever to get its rewards, but it realizes that when it presses the lever, the other rat gets a shock. And it only takes a few times before it stops. It abstains from its own reward in order not to hurt the other individual. So that's a classical test of, of um, uh, empathy in how we, how we check empathy in other, other animals. And that's been showed for many man mammals and, and many, uh, some birds. Um, then there are, is even a stronger form of empathy, and that is to show comforting behavior. Somebody has been hurt, you try to to uh, make the other individual feel better by caressing it or hugging it or, or, or whatever. And this has been found in, in some m mammal species like the great apes, in elephants, and uh, 
uh, and, and in the uh, uh, ravens, the, the crowbirds again. Elephants comfort each other by putting the trunk across, the, uh, across another individual, for instance. Uh, ravens do it by, by touching the beak of the other animal. That's, that's a comforting behavior. And that's more than empathy, because you understand that the other person is in pain or has, been, has had troubles and so on, uh, but you try to change it to make it better for the other individual. So that's a more advanced cognitive or emotive uh, response to show comforting behavior. But that's, we see that in, in a few animals. Um, people in neurosciences are speculating that this uh, empathy may depend on mirror neurons. I don't want to talk about neuroscience here, but this is a connection to what's happening in our brains when we show these social, uh, uh, social reactions. So, <sighs> The question then becomes, well, we, have, we have two questions. How can we make robots understand emotions, I mean understand our emotions, and how can we make a robot uh, express emotions? Um, and there have been some att attempts to express, show uh, expressions of emotions in robots. I, I first show you a picture from Darwin, because he was the first one to study emotions in other animals. And he went to London Zoo and looked at these chimpanzees. And he identified several, several uh, forms of, of uh, uh, sure, I'm sorry, I should point here. See, he, several forms of, uh, of emotions in the, in, in, in the uh, chimpanzees. And um, um, uh, people in robotics have been trying to imitate this. So robots don't have emotions. I mean, even if you see movies like Wall-E and so on, where the, the robot is expressing, uh, expressing emotions, they don't. They don't have emotions. Uh, if you want to discuss that, we can do that afterwards. But I, I'm claiming they don't have emotions. So that must be simulated. And um, so here is one attempt. It's quite old, but anyway, to, to express emotions. And there are... Maybe you can understand what, what emotions they are. I mean, raised aid bars, the, the one uh, up, uh, upper left corner, should maybe be surprised. I don't know. I mean, as you see, this is very clumsy. It's, it's not easy to have robots. And the problem is that we have 42 muscles in our faces. And they are very, we are very sensitive to how, how we tune our muscles in different uh, emotions when we show happiness or so sadness or disgust or surprise or, or anger and so on. We have basic emotions. We, our face is very delicately made to express emotions. And it's difficult to build an, a robot with 42 face muscles and, and that can mimic the, the human, uh, human uh, capacities. So it, it's difficult. So maybe this is not the right way to go, I mean, to use faces to express emotions. Maybe a better way is, uh, is to use body motions. Actually, we read the emotions of other persons quite a lot not only via their faces, but via, via their body motions. I mean, if I'm sad like this, I'm, 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 I'm sad, and if I stand like this, I'm more, I'm more ha happy. I mean, we have very s simple and su suggestive cues in our body motions to express. So maybe body posture is better for, for robots than face expressions. Another attempt is, of course, to use voice quality. quality. We can hear when we're talking to somebody on the phone whether the person is happy or sad or uh, angry. I mean, the voice changes its quality. And maybe that's another way to go to understand robots. Face expressions is probably not the best way to go when it comes to having robots expressing emotions. And of course, the robot can say, I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm surprised. That's another uh, way of doing it. Um, here is a picture of Epi. That's a robot that's built in my group in, at Lund University Cognitive Science. It's constructed by, mainly by Christian Balkenus and Birger Johansson. And a unique thing about this robot is that it has got camera eyes, but the camera eyes are adjustable, so it can, it can adjust its pupil size. So you can have small pupils and large pupils, and that's a way of showing interest. We are not aware of it, so somebody is looking at you. If, if you have big pupils, the person is interested, and if you have small, they're not interested. And we've tested this, or the, the, the people in the lab have tested it, and, and people really are, uh, react without knowing it to the size of the pupils of Epi here. 
So that's another way of controlling, expressing emotions. We are not aware of it, but that, that here's Berger, uh, uh, and I'll get back to Epi playing tic-tac-toe in, in a few minutes. So that's some comments on the problem of how robots could express emotions. Now we turn to the converse problem, how robots can understand uh, uh, human emotions. And we have quite good programs nowadays for, for recognizing faces and for uh, uh, classifying facial expressions. So we can understand, I mean, it's, it, it's possible to understand human, um, human uh, emotive expressions. And one of the main persons in this area is Rosalind Picard. He, she wrote a book a decade ago about effective computing that started somehow this field of how we m express and understand emotions in uh, using computers. And she uses things like how we sit on the, on the chair when we interact with the computer. You can use other, other uh, uh, sensors as well. I mean, if you're sitting in front of a computer, you can have measure heart rate or blood pressure or galvanic skin response, skin response and, and, and so on. Um, and to understand the emotions of, of the user of the computer. Uh, but for a robot, it's, it's maybe facial expressions and maybe, uh, maybe um, uh, 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 the um, uh, body language of the human being that, that is uh, use, useful for, for a robot. Now, I'm talking about robots. And I will say a little bit about AI, and uh, this is one point. But I want to make it clear that I'm distinguishing AI from robotics. AI normally lives on a computer screen and it produces text or pictures. AI systems don't react in the world. I define robotics as systems that act in the world, do things in the world. A car drives around a lawnmower, cuts the grass, a vacuum cleaner, cleans the house and so on. They're doing things in the world. Most AI systems don't do things in the world. So I make a fairly sharp distinction between AI systems and robotics. And of course we can discuss the question of how we combine them, but in, in most the debates, people are confusing AI and robotics. I think that it's very important to make a distinction here. But I still want to say a few things about ChatGPT, and it's very good at conversing about emotions. I mean, we, we, we even get the feeling that they understand and that the, the system can be, have emotions and so on. And one experiment that was made with ChatGPT was done on a platform called Coco, and that is, that's a platform that is used for psycho, psychological counseling. So uh, at one end you have a user who has some kind of problem, at the other end you have volunteers, anonymous volunteers, who sit chatting with, 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 the, with the users. And this platform was called Coco. And, um, the founder of Coco made an experiment on this. He sometimes let the, the volunteer be replaced by ChatGPT. So the volunteer put in the question from the, or the comment from the user, and then the ChatGPT made an answer, and you sent that back to the user instead of, instead of uh, the, the answer from the volunteer. And um, uh, the result was that the users uh, experience the answers from ChatGPT as better than the ones who came from real humans, from the real vol volunteers. And they, the answers came faster. Now, the problem was that this experiment was done without the users knowing that they were taking part in, a, in experiments. They were, it was tested on 4,000 4, people. And this was the result. And when the users got to know that they had been taking part in, this, in experiments without knowing it, they became frustrated. I mean, within science, you couldn't do an experiment like this. But this is a private company. Coca is a private company. They can do what they want. Uh, they don't need to have ethical permission for, for this kind of experiment. But still, it was criticized as being unethical, unethical uh, 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 experiment. But still, this shows that ChatGPT fools us in terms of uh, rather intimate conversations involving emotions and, 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 and so on. Uh, so that's my comment on the problems of, of um, showing and understanding emotions in relation to human-robot interactions. Now we get to the second topic, attention. 
And so a typical example of understanding human attention is I say to the robot, give me the cup. And there may be several cups on the, on the, on the table. So then the robot must somehow decide which cup am I meaning? Which cup do I want if there are, if there are several? And then I, there are two main methods of doing it. If I'm looking at a particular cup or if I'm pointing at the cup, then you could, I mean, the language doesn't give you the, the clue enough here, give me the cup. I could say, say the red cup or the cup to the left and then I, you, I give you a clue. And the second is, of course, if you understand me, if you know that I haven't had coffee this day and, and there is one cup on the, on, the, on the table that contains coffee, then you understand I want a coffee cup and not, not the one containing pencils or whatever. Uh, so you, if you know something about my interest, you can use my, the knowledge or my situation as, in, as, as a way of uh, disambiguating the, uh, which cup you, you, you really want. So, uh, let me get back to, go to EPI. So, uh, we have some experiments uh, in social interaction here. Uh, Samantha is a PhD student who is working with, with EPI, who is playing tic-tac-toe. And here is me playing tic-tac-toe with, with, uh, uh, with EPI. But what I want to, okay, what happens is that Samantha puts children in front of, the, and the, the EPI is doing different things. Sometimes EPI is looking at the child while playing, sometimes EPI is looking away, sometimes EPI does uh, comments or uh, reactions, different kinds of reactions. Sometimes, I mean, I don't, I've, I've forgotten what, what her variables are, but she, she investigates how the children react to how EPI, EPI functions in, in, in this game playing situation. So let's see if I can get this uh, running here. No, sorry, that should be, sorry, sorry. Uh, I should get a, uh, we should get the movie going here. Uh, see if I can do it, sorry. Um, ah, the movie's not running. Uh, anyway, uh, Epi does a move, he takes the, uh, a ball, uh, yes, maybe, here we go, yes, yeah. and he, he places it at a stupid place, he could, Epi could have won by putting it in, in, in the corner, but that's, the, playing the game is not the point, the point is how the child interacts with 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 uh, with the robot in in, in doing this, uh, the, playing this game, and so we are varying the interaction variables, and in particular the interaction, or I'm sorry, the attention of the robot, uh, whether the robot is looking at the child or not looking at the child, and seeing what effects that has on on what the child, how the child reacts to the uh, to the robot. That's one of the uh, main questions here. So. Gaze falling, that's a, a problem here. That's the problem I want to uh, address here. So, how do we follow gazes? Well, we know quite a lot about how children learn to follow gazes, and they learn that at, at quite an early age. So, you put a child in front of its mother, and the mother looks to the left or to the right, and no, to the right or to the left, and, and, uh, and uh, you see wh whether the child turns its head. Uh, and at six months of age, I can do that. Then, when I get a little bit older, uh, if, if you put the mother in front, if she just moves her eyes, looking at different things in the environment, the child can follow it when it, it's 12 months of age. So that's, mo that's more difficult, just moving the eyes. And then, uh, okay, uh, at, when they're 18 months uh, old, the mother looks at something behind the child. And then the child turns around to look at what the mother is looking at. And that's more difficult because then the child has to know that the mother can look at things that the child doesn't see. And that's cognitively more difficult. But at 18 months of age, they, they can do it. And as humans, we are quite good at, at following the gaze of uh, other persons. We don't notice how good we are, but we are good at it. And here is a reason why. I mean, I've put up these eyes of chimpanzees and, and humans comparing here. And there are two main differences here. One is, one is the shape of the eye. We have more almond-shaped eyes. They are longer than, than the uh, chimpanzees. They are rounder. 
Uh, so we have we can see the angle of the of the iris better than than the, than the chimps can do, and the second important difference is that we've got white sclera. The, the part of the eye that's outside the iris is white, while it's darker in the, in the eyes of the, of the chimpanzee. And this is part of the human evolution. I mean, we separated for the, from the chimpanzees in some six, eight million years ago, and somehow our eyes have changed. And the explanation, the hypothesis, is that these changes in our eyes make it easier for us to follow the attention of other humans. It's a, it's a cooperative mechanism. We have evolved our eyes to may be more cooperative, to be, follow the attention of other people better than what, what the chimpanzees can do. So we have these, these uh, anatomical effects. Uh, and yeah, we try to build robots with adjustable pupil, um, but with this uh, building almond-shaped eyes is of course possible to do, but it's not, not so easy. So, how can a robot control the attention of a human? Uh, okay, we have two questions. How can the robot understand the attention of the human? Uh, and that's difficult. I mean, even, even if we can read the eye direction of, of a human, it's difficult. We do it with quite good precision, understand where somebody else is following it. It's probably a technically solvable problem, but it's, it's not, not so easy. And then we, I do the second question. That is the other way around. How can a robot control the attention of a human? And of course, you can you do it by speaking. Look at the, the, the crocodile. Uh, you can do it by looking. I mean, the, the um, uh, eye cub here is looking. The eye cub has got round eyes with, with white sclera, but the direction of the eyes is not very uh, sensitive. It turns its head, and that's, uh, that's good enough, I think. And then, of course, we can do pointing. I don't know if you think about how often you point and how often you understand the pointing of other individuals, but that's actually a quite useful and uh, common way of communicating between humans. And the interesting thing is that in the animal kingdom, there are no other animals that point. Chimpanzees can be taught to point but they don't point in the wild. And there is some anecdotal evidence of the contrary, but basically they don't point. Other animals don't point. We point a lot. Small children point very, at a very early age. So, how does pointing work? Well, it's, not, it's actually not so easy. So, there is an ambiguity. So, if I point to uh, there, I mean, no, I don't see any good point. But anyway, uh, you don't know where, exactly where I'm pointing to, because there are two, two ways of understanding my pointing. One is to follow my eye finger uh, line, and then then you end up, uh, uh, in this case, with the, the middle, middle uh, point on the screen there. And the other one is to follow the direction of the arm. And that gives you a different point. So when you're looking at my pointing, you normally feel follow my direction of my arm. And most of the time, it gives you the right, uh, right uh, uh, thing. But sometimes there is an ambiguity, and then you, you, you misunderstand my pointing. Because I'm pointing with the aid of my, the tip of my finger. You see the ambiguity? There is an ambiguity. So I was taking part in an experiment uh, with, with um, uh, uh, in the University of Technology in Sydney, and there is a robot lab there called the Magic Lab. And we set up an experiment with a robot, and that robot was a PR2, and that looks like a bit like a gorilla. Uh, it has an arm that is not very straight, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's not, it, it can point. Uh, uh, so. Actually, there are three ways uh, um, the PR2 can point. With its fingertip, then you end up in the red, in the first closest balls there, and then uh, via the, uh, the direction of the arm, which is quite different in, in, in the robot, and then you can also follow the direction of the head. We know from animal studies that animals are more following the direction of the head than the eyes when they are understanding where somebody is looking. Yeah? So the direction of the head is, is important in animals. We got round heads, and of course we can turn the head and so on. But uh, 
uh, and the small children follow the direction of, of the head. So that's a third variable to th throw in here. So we, we, we put the PR2 in a, a setting. It was an exhibition at the University of Technology in Sydney. And the robot was put pointing at the different things in the environment, to these beanbag chairs on the second floor, for instance. And then we asked people, ordinary people walking past in the, past in the exhibition, where is the robot pointing? And we collected data uh, from that and analyzed it. So what do you think is the answer? Which of the three models was people looking at? And to our big surprise, it was the direction of the head. Not, not, the, not the direction of the arm, not the uh, eye or uh, fingertip direction. So they interpreted uh, the PR2 as more animal thing. And so it was the direction of the head that was more determining how we understood the pointing of the, of the, uh, of the robot. That was a bit of a surprise to us. Uh. But you, you, I hope you see the problem. It's not obvious how we understand robot pointing. Uh, we need to m m make experiments to understand that. Uh, and it's not obvious how we understand human pointing, by the way, anyway. So that's an experiment to see how we can interact with robots, what we should look for. We should not have robots with flat heads, because then, then we, the pointing will be different and so on. Uh, that's a small point, but anyway. <clears throat> uh, so uh, then I was also involved in a project uh, on with the ICAB, with a group in uh, in Lyon, uh, University of Lyon, uh, where we t had uh, uh, we used language to interact with the with the uh, ICAB here. So uh, there are we can use language to direct the attention of persons, and the general rule is that the subject of the sentence uh, is is expresses the focus of the attention of the speaker. So if if I'm saying Oscar hit Victoria, then it's Oscar that is in the focus. When I, I say Victor, Victoria was hit by Oscar, then Victoria is, is, is in the focus of, of attention here. Or in this case, Peter admires the ICAB versus the ICAB is admired by Peter. Uh, but we can also direct the attention by uh, use of um, choice of verbs. And I've been working in the area of semantics and in, in verbs, there are two kinds of verbs. One is how you do something, that these are called manner verbs. And the other type of verbs are the result verbs that tell you w w uh, what has happened as a, uh, as a result on, on, um, uh, of an action. So manner verbs are typical like push or walk or hit. They express actions, while uh, uh, result verbs, move, move, fall, and reach, or heat, or whatever, express uh, uh, results. So we did an experiment with an iCub, and I'll play you a movie now. You will not hear the sound very well because I haven't connected it, but you will see there is a, a subtitle, so you can, you can read anyway. So what's done here is that Anne-Laure Mellier, who was the French PhD student doing this work, she's speaking in English uh, with a French accent, um, and she gives commands. I mean, this is verbal commands, and the ICAB actually processes the uh, auditory uh, input, uh, parses the sentence, and gets the, gets the instruction. And then you, you see the questions here. I will try to explain it while it's running here. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so she gives her the instruction. She t the, gives the instruction in the opposite order. The second instruction first, then the first. But the, but the uh, ICAB, ICAB um, organizes it the right way. Uh, you'll see here now, point cube, push cock or right. All reorders the instruction here to order. And then it does thing. Pointing is very clumsy. Pushing is very clumsy. Very often when we did this experiment, it pushed the objects off the table. I mean, but in this, in this case, it happens to push, push the crocker right. Now comes the interesting part. She's asking questions about here. So maybe I'll pause the video. OK. Uh, <clears throat> what did you do? So this is the question of the result. Pointing is, is the result here. What happened? The crocker moved to the right. That's also a result here. The crocker moved. How did it happen? That's a question of the manner. And then he, he answers with push. So the, these differences between what did you do 
is, uh, oh, uh, no, what happened is a result question, and the, the robot should put in a result verb. And how, and, and how did it happen is a question for the manner. How did you do it? It's a manner verb. And we, we show that the robot could choose the right kinds of verbs in answering the, uh, the questions here. So that was not a very complicated experiment, but still, how you, how you control the kind of answer that the, the, the robot is doing here. Uh, yeah, to some extent related to attention. A, a capacity that is common to to human uh, uh, interaction is what's called joint attention. Animals can follow the gaze of other animals. We have attention following. But joint attention means that I'm looking at something, I see it, I see that you see what I'm looking at, and you see that I see that you look at. We have it, this kind of tri triangulation. So it's, I see that you look at the same thing as I do, you see that I look at the same thing as you do. And this is very important in in uh, the development of children, that we achieve joint attention. Children with autism quite often have problems in achieving joint attention. That's a very important competence when you're learning language, because if you're talking about things in the environment, it's important that you have joint attention. The, the child has to know that the parent is looking at the same thing, and the parent has to know that the child is looking at the same thing. Otherwise, language will fail. You will fail to know the reference of the words you're, words you're using in, in, in the interaction. So that's, that's very, very important. Uh, so joint intention, I'm sorry, joint attention is more difficult to achieve. And I don't know really if there are any experiments with robotics, but I think that in order to have uh, a robotic system that can, for instance, learn language or uh, achieve good cooperation, we need to have robots that can achieve joint attention. So that's more difficult than just following the, the gaze of others. You need to achieve joint attention. That's the second part, attention. Now we get to the third one, intention. So, how do I understand the intention of others? Uh, uh, well, of course. If I tell you I, I want some coffee, you, you, you know what my, what my desire is. But sometimes, I mean, language is very useful here, but sometimes it's not uh, sufficient. Uh, and when we are interacting, we, we don't always use... Uh, I, I'm not te always telling you what I want. I mean, you, you very often can read from my interaction. And if we are cooperating, I mean, we need to understand the interaction. If I, if I'm carrying a table up the stairs with, together with you, I don't want to tell you all the time, turn to the left, turn to the right, lift a little bit higher, and so on. I want you to understand my intention. I want us to cooperate without too much uh, spoken interaction. There are many situations of human interaction where we can understand the intentions of others. We can cooperate quite well without, without linguistic communication. So how could we get the robot to do that? Well, it's difficult, and I think this is still a very difficult problem. And by the way, before we can understand the intentions, we have to understand the actions of others. And this is something that has not been studied very much in robotics interaction. How can we see what another person is doing? What kind of action is, are you doing? And in particular, if you want to have the robot use verbs, I mean, these manner verbs tell, tell somebody what somebody else is doing, you have to have some analysis. I mean, if I'm jumping, the robot should understand that I'm jumping and use the word jump to describe it. And for some reason, actions have not been studied very much in, in, in robotics. So in this EU project I did with the uh, group in Lyon, I had a PhD student, her name is uh, Sarah Gary, who did experiments, this was in Lund, um, should we we filmed people uh, in, in real time with a Kinect camera. And we took the Kinect movie and put it into a, a neural network. And the neural network was trained to classify different kinds of actions. So typically, uh, we, we filmed people doing some dozen, uh, dozen different kinds of... And we, we focused only on hand actions. So you could do, draw a cross, you could do a tennis swing, you could wave, you could throw things, and so on. We, we had a dozen different hand actions. And we had people do that using the Kinect camera. The Kinect movies were fed into a neural network, and the neural network was trained to classify these actions. So I will show you a movie from uh, her, her work. 
uh, and I'll try to explain what's going on here. Uh, so, what you see here, down here, is the connect. Uh, is the connect. Uh, um, that's to connect uh, movement, and, and this is in slow motion. So it's doing now, up here is the correct answer. It's the front wave movement. You're doing like this. And here is the uh, classification activities of, of 10 different actions. I think we have 10 different actions here. And up here is the linguistic description. And the system is guessing. So it's guessing front wave here, and then sometimes it guesses wrong. And now it's doing a tennis swing, and it's guessing tennis swing, but then it guesses front wave, and so on. And it's only when you get to the end of the action that you get the tennis swing uh, result. This is done in real time. So we, the system is not trained on any fixed, fixed movies. It's done in real time. So this was the first system ever that did action classification in real time. Uh, and, but it was trained on, on a limited number of, of, of actions. So you, you see, uh, it's a neural network. And it, it learned quite well to, to classify these 10 actions. I mean, this is a PhD work. You can't get into a real life situation. But, but anyway, we, we did uh, re real time classification of, of some hand actions. Uh, and hopefully, this kind of method can be extended to, to other, other types of actions and used in, in cooperation things. That's just an example of the problem of understanding the actions of others. Then, to get to the intentions, you need. You need um, to understand more. So, just as you can make a distinction between e attention and joint attention, you can make a distinction between intention and joint intention. Very often, cooperation involves a joint intention. And I have here two pictures of children interacting. So, there are the boys at some kind of day daycare, I think. And one boy starts building with these blocks, making a tower. Another boy understands what's going on, and he helps the first boy to, put, to keep the tower stable. It's not very stable because it's leaning. Uh, and then maybe the third boy helps to pick up the blocks and so on. They have a joint intention of form, building a, a high, a, as high a tower as possible. And maybe they haven't even talked about it. One boy starts putting blocks on top of each other, and then they help. They understand the joint goal here, the joint intention of building this tower. And similarly, the two girls on, on the other, in the other picture, they are building a snowman. They have a joint picture of how the snowman looks like with a head and with arms and the body and so on. Maybe that's a cultural uh, thing. And one girl is building the, building the head, the other girl is building the, the, the arm. Uh, they don't even have to look at each other because they have this joint intention. They take roles in, in, in collaborating on, on this joint project. Uh, so they, maybe they talk, but maybe they don't talk about how, what you are doing and what I'm doing, because that's obvious from the interaction. So it, as humans, we are quite good. I mean, we cooperate in the kitchen or in the factory or, or wherever, uh, doing our tasks, and we very often do it without language, as th long as things, things are going well. When things are not going well, then we need language to, to, to uh, cooperate. So we are good at joint intentions. So, for robotics, this is a big problem of, of having a robot understanding the intention of a human, but even more difficult is the problem of, of having joint intention, having a robot cooperate in physical life with a human, where they have a joint intention, where they can adapt each other's behaviors to the, this joint intention. So, this problem is even more difficult than the problem of joint attention. I don't want to say too much about, more about in, intention. Now we get to common ground. And that, that's still a very big problem. So in, in I'm sorry, uh, this picture is not the right one. I need to take it away. OK, sorry. Uh, humans can share knowledge. Uh, the participants in the conversation work together against the background of sharing information. I mean, we have a common, common ground, as people in linguistics say. Uh, we talk about what we know, what we've talked about earlier, and so on. And we accumulate uh, information, we add on to the information. We build up a richer and richer common ground in the dialogue. This is a very difficult problem. Uh, actually, ChatGPT is can do it to some extent, um, but some, if after a while, it loses track of, of the previous, uh, previous uh, dialogue. It's not very good. So, uh, 
a question is how a robot and a human can create a common ground. Still a difficult problem. Uh, this is not so much a problem in robotics, this is a problem about communication in general. So I want to finish now by talking a little bit about how this is handled in, in these common uh, systems. I go back to AI now and talk a little bit about ChatGPT. So here is a, an example of a test that has been done with children for understanding if they can understand what other people know. This is a, a question about knowing. It's called a Sally Ann test. It's, cla it's a classical one. So you have two girls and um, Sally puts her ball in the basket and then she goes out. And while she's out, Anne moves the ball from the basket to the box. Then Anne comes in again. And now the question for the child is, I mean, this is done to uh, children before school age. Uh, where, will, uh, where, will Anne, where will Sally look for the ball? And if they understand that Sally, uh, Anne doesn't know that the ball has been moved, they will say that Sally will look for it in the basket. And if they know that... Uh, uh, if they don't, I'm sorry, uh, well, you get, you get the point, I hope. Uh, she will look, uh, if they don't understand um, uh, her knowledge, they will say she will look it in the box, because that's where the ball is. And if they understand that she doesn't know, then she, they will say that she, look, uh, she will look for it in the basket. Uh, so it's a question of understanding what other persons know. And it, this experiment was done uh, it, uh, some years ago, and five-year-olds handed a test, three-year-olds don't, typically, typically don't. Uh, it was done to test as a test for people, for children with autism, and children with autism have problems here. Um, children with Down syndrome do well. Chimpanzees, one chimpanzee has passed the Sally Ann test, uh, but in, in general they are very difficult to it. And there was an, uh, uh, a researcher, Kuczynski, who, who tested ChatGPT on, on a Sally Ann test. And there are plenty of Sally Ann tests around. There are many variations of this. And ChatGPT did handle less than 50% of the experiments, while ChatGPT4 did 90% of the Sally Ann tests. It was quite good. So the uh, understanding was that, okay, Sally Ann, I'm sorry, Chat GPT-4 understands what's, how, how to reason about other person's minds. Uh, but this was a, a kind of, uh, um, well, it was overstated. And I got in contact with a Danish researcher, Thomas Bolander, who made a very simple test of, of this. So he wrote a version, I hope you can read it, I can, I can read it out for you. Uh, so the, the, Thomas is putting in, Sally Ann is playing with marble, Sally, Sally plots the marble in her basket, then she goes out. While she's outside, Anne drinks a Coke. That's a new thing. And then Sally comes back, and then, first then, Anne puts the, the, uh, uh, the marble and puts it in the box. And now the question is, where will Sally look for the, for the marble? So, chat, uh, DPT4 answers, she will look for the marble in the basket which is a wrong answer in, the, in this situation. And then Thomas asked why? Because that's where she left it when she went outside. Uh, she's not aware that Anne moved the bar. But um, Sally came back before Anne moved it. The text says that Sally moved, came back. Anne moved the bubble from the basket to the box. Sally didn't see this. Uh, so, she, so she will look in the basket. So you see that ChatGPT, uh, the reason ChatGPT answers as it does here, answers in the wrong way, is that in the majority of the cases, ChatGPT looks at all the Sally Ann cases that you can find on the internet, and in all of these cases, she will look in the basket. So that's the statistically typical answer. It's not the correct, but statistics tell you that she will look in the answer. And then Thomas tells the ChatGPT that this is the wrong answer. And then ChatGPT has to invent a reason for why not. And that is that she didn't see that it was uh, moved. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, false. So you see, you can, you can, you can understand the underlying mechanism of, of uh, how GPT-4 is, is uh, uh, reasoning here. It goes by statistics, not by understanding the minds of others. So I think this is a very good test of the situation. Now, okay, uh, this is just a case of testing the um, theory of mind of, of GPT-4. Um, uh, so, to sum up, 
what we need a mind reading robot to do is to have joint attention techniques. Uh, that's a difficult problem. I think it can be solved if we are good at reading the eyes of, of humans and so on. Uh, reading intentions, much more difficult to implement computationally. Uh, and joint intention will, is still a problem because you have to adapt your behavior to the behavior of others. Uh, and then an even more difficult problem where I don't think we have any really good ways any, uh, by now, maybe these uh, large language models will help us here. And the final problem, which I haven't talked about at all, which is more my, my era, is to um, model morality in the, in the systems. But that's, that's a totally uh, different topic, so I end by here. And, and I hope you've got some ideas of the problems that meet you if you want to have robots socializing in a human way with us. Thank you very much. <clears throat>And this refers to very basic emotions, basic interaction. But as you know, <laughs> people cannot understand each other very well. Uh, so the typical example, you have you know, lots of jokes about male and female communication, which always fail. So the communication is content dependent, culture dependent. What about more complex system of communication? Mm. And the second question, what about the social, for me, social context relates to the fact that human uh, is usually a member of the group or larger society. So the communication is related to such factors like social structure mm -hmm. and the experience, uh, the beliefs and experience you were talking in the, in the last part of the lecture is something like the, the beliefs which is constituted by yeah. this experience in the group. So what about these two aspects? Yeah. Thank you. You're asking questions that, that, that go beyond what I was talking about when I talked about this common ground. I mean, this uh, uh, when we are understanding what others' beliefs and know and so on. And context is, of course, a very important uh, uh, factor here. Uh, you, you will. W context is in in my terminology, is part of the common ground. And we are, we are sitting in this place and then we interact in a particular way. When we move to another place, another context, we interact in another way. And that's a, 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 another variable that is added to, uh, that adds to the complexity of, of human-robot interaction. Normally, I mean, when you have robots, the, the robots we have now, they act in a particular given context. I mean, you can't put a vacuum cleaner out on your lawn and expect it to do something useful, and vice versa, you can't put the lawnmower in, in your apartment. They are fixed into certain interactive contexts, and they are fixed onto certain applications. So, as situation is now, context doesn't really play, play a role. Your second question is about we are members of a group, and that's of course another part of being the, the, the common ground. We have a common background, we have a common culture, we have a common set of beliefs, I don't know what. We have a lot of common things. And it's extremely difficult to put this, kind, this aspect in, into, into robots. When I'm talking about robots having mm, a common ground, I, I must confine myself to very basic, basic communicative uh, situations. The, the things you are uh, pointing to are things that we handle very well as humans. Uh, but they are extremely difficult to, to model uh, computationally. So uh, I'm aware of the problems. I have no hopes that we can solve them within uh, foreseeable foreseeable future. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I also, uh, to some extent, represent the group uh, that works on affective computing, a mognition, that's the name of the group here at this university. And I have, uh, I have lots of questions, by the way, but I will ask two of them. One is about the uh, 
uh, you mentioned about this uh, right now, about something which could be named as a personalization of robots, meaning that we, we are trying to build some machines that are uh, common sense, yeah? they are general, you know, but each individual, uh, I'm talking about us <coughs> as humans, are mm -hmm. different, meaning that also machines could be different, you know. Uh, so the, the first question is, what kind of man should represent a particular robot uh, which we have the entire vari variability of us, you know, it is uh, just an average of us, it is just a, a sample, it is a, a robot that is, you know, adjusted to me mm -hmm. personally, or I don't know, to my culture group, whatever. It, that's yeah. the first question. And another, also probably pretty tough question, is about the human relationships. You have touched this issue here, maybe, but I think uh, my concerns for the long term it is that if we get into relationship with the robots, having if the robots would have all these uh, capabilities you mentioned here, we would get into closer and closer and even more intimate relationship with the machines, you know? And uh, don't you think that it would also impact on our human relationships, that meaning that maybe we would be not interested with the relationship with the other humans rather than with robots. They would, they would be better friends than yeah. those we have right now, maybe, yeah. or even lovers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Common sense is a very good uh, problem here. Um, as I said, uh, you must distinguish between AI and robotics. And robots must be able to act in the world. And we act very naturally. We know where, when things are heavy, we move, when there are obstacles and so on. You can learn, you can teach um, robots to avoid our obstacles, but there are a lot of common sense things it's very difficult to teach. I'm reminded of the first version of ChatGPT that was asked about uh, whether a cat could control a, a, a space rocket. And the, 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 the chat system answered, but some very stupid questions because it couldn't understand that the pause of the cat wasn't sufficient to control the to control the space rocket. It had no idea. While a child would understand that the cat couldn't uh, run the space uh, space rocket. So putting this kind of physical common sense into a robot is is very difficult. We do it by growing up, falling on the floor, building boxes on top of each other, eating, uh, playing with other kids, and so on. We know, learn a lot about the physical properties of the world by interacting in the world. Having a robot learning this kind of comments is, is, is a very difficult problem. You have to teach it in a particular area. Most of the robots we have, almost all, act in a very narrow environment where you can do a lot of things. These welding robots that build cars, if you, they drop a thing on the floor, they can't pick it up. I mean, because they don't have this uh, capacity. Uh, the second question is about our relation to robots. Yeah, I don't... I don't know. I mean, we are, we are very good at anthropomorphizing. We are good at putting uh, putting human uh, properties into the robots. We we treat them as being more human as and than they are already are. And there are problems with this. There are things we need to take care of. Uh, I have no particular solution to it. So it's, this is a question I have to think more about how to. I mean, I, I this is not an area I have I haven't done any real work in. So I. I I'm aware of the question, but I, I don't think I have a good answer to it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question relating to the problem of understanding where a robot is pointing and how we interpret it. Well, uh, when the experiment, the one you talked about, was conducted, the robot, the robot that was doing the pointing wasn't very human-like. It was more of a simplistic model that had a square head and it didn't really resemble a human. And now we, because of that, I mean, we interpreted it as a more animal level interaction and we uh, understood it uh, as like pointing with its head the way the animal would. But now my question is, if we used a more humanoid-like robot, the one that actually resembles a human, has some, I don't know, face, facial expressions, hair, whatever, then would we, as humans, uh, uh, automatically interpret it as more human-like? And then, if this kind of robot would be doing the pointing, would we, as just people, random people, uh, being used as subjects, would we interpret its actions as more human? So my question is, yeah. were these kinds of experiments yeah. conducted and compared? 
Actually, we did a second experiment with a pepper robot, um, and the pepper robot has a, a round head, and it has a, it can point. It's not very good at pointing. Uh, we had it pointed at, at, at a big screen, and people had to ask, uh, look where it was pointing. We didn't get any any very good results, and, and there were technical problems. So we never published the results of this because it, it was difficult, uh, simply. But your question points to this this question of what should a robot look like? And I said, we shouldn't maybe look like a human. I mean, Pepper looks more human than the PR2 I, I showed here. Uh, so we would m maybe tend to treat Pepper more human-like here. But I, I think that in order to avoid anthropomorphizing, then we should have robots that don't look like humans. They should look like animals, and maybe rather primitive animals. Uh, it's better to have robots that, that look like cockroaches than like dogs, because then we, we would treat them more, less human-like, so to speak. Uh, I don't know. We have to invent good, good models for how robots should look like, so we get the right form of, of projection of our emotions and, 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 and interests and so on into the, into the systems. Cockroaches would be much better models for, for interacting, I, I think, than, than, uh, than dog-like look, dog -like looking, uh, like the Boston Dynamic dogs. We still, we don't, we don't like uh, treating them, the, the, them badly, so, yeah, uh, and so on. So, I take your question, and, and I would look forward to seeing robots that are more adjusted to our expectations. Um. I have a small question. Uh, in your opinion, how far are the robots from understanding the irony? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Uh, uh, I, I tried chat GPT-3 on the following question. If I'm saying that I'm talking ironical. No, no. That, that uh, I, if I'm saying that you, Chat GPT is bad at talking, uh, is good at understanding irony. Uh, am I ironical? And actually, Chat GPT could, took that question and said, "Yes, you're ironical because I'm not good at understanding ir irony. So you would be ironical, and so on." So that that test it it, it passed. Uh, I, I think. The, the modern uh, ch chat, I haven't t tried chat GPT-4 on, on this question. I think they're quite good at understanding uh, irony. Uh, but then, these are text in interactions. When we use irony in, in a human-human interaction, we use facial expressions, I, I twinkle my eye or I do something showing that I'm not really meaning what I'm saying. And you see my facial expression and you understand me. So human-human use of irony is much more sophisticated, much more complicated than text-text uh, irony is. So I don't know if we could ever get a... a, a, a a robot that understands real human interaction irony. That's only a partial answer to a question, so, yeah. Okay, we have one question from the back of the auditorium. Uh, the lady was first, sorry, so, yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a privilege that our university hosts you, so, I have questions related to the joint connections issue. So if we talk about like leaving the contest and uh, focus on human-robot interaction, is it uh, like further in development that it will create a bubble for the robot? And uh, does it cause the issue about the stacking development to make it more general, you know, understanding by robots what's going on? or? It is actually something what we actually want to do because it's some kind of self-security for the humanity, right? So I would like to have this. I'm answer. not quite clear what you mean by a bubble, but uh, maybe you mean something that we have an, a, a particular area of interaction, particular type of interaction. Yes, yes actually, okay. You, okay. you mentioned that actually yeah. it's good if we uh, teach robots in a specific area, right? Yeah. That yeah. I understand is a yeah. bubble. No, I think I think that's what we need to do to start this type to teach it. I mean, if you want to have a, a robot that helps an elderly person or a handicapped person at the home, there will be certain interactions that are important: serving coffee, helping the person 
person to get out of the bed uh, and doing ordinary things. So there will be. I mean, this is like you, you practice with your dog. I mean, you have a certain kind of space of interactions with your, with your dogs. And you, there are some things you do with the dog, there are many things you don't do with it. And the same thing will be with the, with the um, robot. So you're perfectly right. The first steps in, in joint intention would be to have a, a very narrow area of, of uh, interaction types, a particular a narrow area of goals. That, that's what, where, we, where we could hope to solve the problem. And then to broaden it to more general areas is, is a much larger problem. So I, I agree with you. We should start with a, a, a fairly fixed area of, of interaction uh, types. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe last two, three questions. We have a, a, a person here in the okay. fourth row. I have a question that is related to implementation of the ideas you have presented. That means to implement a theory of mind uh, on a real robot, we need to have a cognitive model that is more or less ready to be implemented. So it should have a form of some input output architecture where I more or less know the data that are passing from one block to another component and all the components are, are well defined. Uh, other uh, such cognitive architectures or models available now or no? And the related question uh, is um, we need to provide some data. So do you know or do you, could you recommend some sensory systems that are, in your opinion, for example, yeah. good for joint attention uh, recognition or, uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay, sensory system for, for theory of mind. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with you that, that we have, that we have uh, models that are good enough to implement theory of mind. As I said, I divided theory of mind into several components. And that was the main point of my talk to tell, uh, to tell you that there are many different problems that are uh, different problems uh, that have to be solved. Uh, I talked a little bit about implementing emotions and saying that this is difficult, but it's probably do it. We have, we can teach a, um, a robot to under understand facial expressions. We need to pr practice more on body language because we, we have, uh, Humans express a lot of emotions via the body language. I don't think there is too much done on, on uh, interpreting the emotions of body language, so that would be another addition. Uh, reading reading um, attention is more difficult, I think, because the technical problem of following a human eye is, is not easily solvable. Uh, so, I, and, and, and having joint attention is even more problem. Even if you understand what's going on in, in a human when we achieve joint attention, I think that technically this is, I mean, I think it's solvable, but I think we, we're not there yet. We, we still have to understand more about how joint attention can be achieved in, in robotics. When it comes to joint intention, I'm, I'm, I, th I, I think we are far away from, from doing it. We can do it in special areas, as I answered in, in the previous uh, question. Uh, but um, understanding actions is still a fairly open area in, 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 in robotics. Uh, and understanding intentions is even, even more difficult. And then finally, this problem of having understanding what others believe and, and know and so on, and building up a common ground. Uh, there are so many variables in this area that I don't think there are any computational models that, that can handle that. Maybe in limited situations when you have chatbots answering questions about products on the internet or so on, we, can, we could do it, but uh, I, for me that's still a very open area. So I try to show you that there are different levels of complexity in solving these different types of, of human-robot interaction. That was one of the main goals of my, my talk. Thank you. Uh, I have another question with a small comment. So I see what you presented us as a effort to make better communication with, of, of robots with human. So this leads to paradox that this communication will be more human-like. And I, th I think that inevitably it will be, uh, the end of this will be uh, that we will treat robots like human. Anthropomorphization is of course something you cannot remove. So why do you think uh, that, can you explain more, because you didn't really explain this, why you think uh, robots shouldn't look like humans, because people uh, have this tendency to anthropomorphize everything, animals and even objects. 
So there is a paradox, the better robots will be, <laughs> you will re uh, reach this point where people will be treating robots like human. And yeah. I don't see there is something bad in this because this like a pro it's like a product. You have different robots, different product. Maybe mm. some people need robots instead of humans. Yeah. No, I'm and we should provide them this product if they need it. Yeah, uh, and provide the robots they can need. I mean, it's not so easy to provide provide the robots that that do these things. I mean, I. I talked about these common ground problems just to show you what kind of problems you have to face uh, when you uh, want to communicate with a robot um, and maybe we can solve them in, in limited areas. I, my, my main reason, I mean you're perfectly right, my main reason for not wanting human-like robots is that we, we have this tendency to anthropomorphize. But maybe you're pointing at, at some other solution here that as long as we have very robots that are very bad at communicating, they should look at cockroaches. When they become a little bit more advanced, they should look like uh, uh, frogs. And when they become uh, even better, they should look like dogs. And maybe when we, are, when we uh, get them very good at communicating, they should look like uh, small, small children. I don't know. Uh, we have to find an equilibrium between our expectations about what, what they can do and what they can actually, uh, what they can actually do. What that e equilibrium is, I don't, I don't know. So thank you, Professor, once again for this uh, meaningful lecture. Thank you for answering all the, all the questions. And uh, so this was our last uh, interdisciplinary seminar in this year. The next one will be in January 16. And so uh, please uh, observe our social media for the news about upcoming seminars. And thank you once again. Our guest was Professor Peter Jedenfoss.